In the US, we look at each chemical in isolation. So the whole idea is that you don't take a class, but just one chemical and decide whether or not you would allow, you would uh, ban, etc. And uh, this is a very uh, inefficient way to regulate because in the first place, in the Federal Register, there are 80,000 chemicals and very few of them have been tested for any endpoint. So we have a list of chemicals and we do not know uh, what their toxicity is in the first place. Second place, they are allowed into the environment if they pass uh, very basic tests. There wasn't any test for endocrine disruption and now this is being elaborated into a protocol uh, but it's not yet active. So it has, not only it goes chemical by chemical, but it doesn't look at how these chemicals interact with other chemicals. So in sum, it's very expensive, very slow, and very inadequate. The European Union, instead, uh, adopted the precautionary principle. But the precautionary principle is also, uh, is in principle, I would say, is wonderful that they have done that. Uh, of course, like everything else, you get criticism because they say that it depends how you apply it. However, in essence, and in a nutshell, what this is saying is that if you gather evidence that a chemical may be harmful, you can, at that point, regulate based on this, uh, say, scant evidence or low-level evidence, and conduct more tests. And then decide, say, you can choose a period for testing, and so you ban first, and that is just for a short period, then do more re research, and then revisit the issue. And in fact, they have done that with uh, uh, phthalates, because they, uh, there were many papers in rats and mice and that indicate, uh, indicated that phthalates could affect the uh, male reproductive organs, especially if the boy was exposed during fetal life. So they took this precaution, and meanwhile, in the five years in which this was, um, the, the, the um, exposure of children was reduced, a very important paper was published in which it was shown that the levels of phthalates in the mother's blood inversely correlated with the defects in the male organs. In other words, if your mother had a lot, your external genitalia will be less masculinized, so you are less of a boy, in other words. That made them to support a stronger um, banning of these chemicals or limit of the exposure of these chemicals to infants. So you see, it's a very good thing because it may have a problem here and there, but it has one virtue. You can stop human exposure or reduce it while you find out with more precision what's going on. So it's really protective. What the EPA is doing is not, because you just can't do all this timely. And actually, we are very concerned because right now in uh, places like Denmark where people, they have a single-payer system, so they have the records of everyone. And they are noticing that assisted reproduction is more and more in demand. And that doesn't represent a uh, uh, fashion. I mean, 6% apart, apparently of the birds right now are assisted. So they look at who are the couples that resort to this type of assisted reproduction and are the youngest people. And that makes them 
think that perhaps is all these exposures that is creating this reproductive problem. Instead of the public or the government to show what is uh, wrong with these chemicals, it would make sense that the uh, manufacturer would tell us that they are convinced that these products are safe instead of us waiting or the public waiting for decades until we show the effects. So from a precautionary principle it would make more sense that the manufacturer be told that they have to vouch for the safety of the products that they send into the market. Once that I testified uh, before a subcommittee of the House of Representatives, uh, Representative Waxman said something very interesting to me and to all of the people there. That is that EPA was born already with a problem. Uh, it's, as he put it metaphorically, the, uh, its hands were already tied up because together with its uh, uh, mandate to be the Environmental Protection Agency, there was this clause about the economic repercussions of what they did. And so therefore, you are putting two opposites in the hands of the same regulatory agency. And that, I think, is the mother of all trouble. But now go. Which means to say that, on the one hand, the EPA is charged with uh, protecting us, and at the same time, uh, protecting the industry. And these are opposites that sometimes don't mix well. There are uh, a number of uh, actors in this uh, uh, play. And one of them is uh, uh, the public. We live in a democracy. And one of the attributes of a democratic uh, system is the participation of the public in deciding, or at least influencing more uh, actively, what the government is supposed to done, uh, do to us or do for us. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, there is a, uh, a a tendency in the electorate not to uh, learn as much as they could about the problems that we are facing. And in fact, it is a, a, in a way a paradoxical that the beneficiaries are ourselves. Nevertheless, we, for reasons that are difficult to fathom, in a society like ours, industrialized and educated, the public uh, uh, is not playing a very active role in deciding what is that or what are the basic principles under which regulation ought to be exercised. Unfortunately, this is something that, again, uh, relates to the electorate. This is not a, a something unique to science related issues or to consumer related issues. We see this uh, in all walks of life. I think that the only uh, positive point is the activists that there are. Uh, be the environmental activists, be the uh, cancer uh, activists that are now pushing for regulation of bisphenol A. And it's through their 
relentless effort that this issue is moving and uh, I recognize their educational role because they are educating people and their role in pushing this agenda. What you see is that we are concentrating in a very focused area that is bisphenol A, the fetus, the newborn, women in reproductive age, which is already a lot compared to the nothing that we have, right? But again, this makes me uh, bring uh, back the issue of the precautionary principle because we are acting piecemeal and while we are doing all this, we are not learning enough about what is to come. And we are introducing, for example, nanoparticles everywhere. And now they have been found in the brain and they have been find, found in the testes. So, well, you can say, well, they are there. It doesn't mean that they are doing anything wrong. Well, now we have to wait 50 years to know whether they are doing something wrong or not. Have we learned that first we have to study the problem and only when the chemical is safe allow human exposure? And we did it with DES, we did it with pesticides, we did it with many different things. And that is the only pessimistic thing that uh, I cannot avoid to tell you. We don't seem to learn.